It's Wednesday, April 26, 2017. It's time for Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. I'm Greg Watkins, the editor at worthpoint.com, and it's time to talk to our antiques and collectibles expert, Harry. Harry, how you doing? Hey, um, well, I'm catching up here trying to, we got a letter in, in the mail, and I'm trying to pull it up here. And I thought I could do it real quick and easy, but what the hell? That doesn't, life doesn't always look that way. Uh, so hang in there while I hit the right switch, and now we're good to go. Hey, here it is. Another end of April already. Four months. Yeah. But that's okay. How you been? I've been good. I, I'm uh, wrapping up my student teaching and uh, looking for a job. Well, I've actually uh, had an interesting week. Uh, my good friend Barb Jersey over in uh, Lansing, Michigan, is having an estate sale. And... Uh, Included in that sale, are you ready for this, is a, yeah. is a bunch of stamps. The woman bought sheets of stamps. back back. If you collected stamps in the 40s and 50s, 60s, one of the things that the collectors did is they would go down to post office and buy an entire sheet of stamps, right? Yes. Hundreds of stamps, sheets. Oh, okay. Plus plate blocks. I mean, she's plate blocked up. So, <laughs> okay. So, you know... And, and there was a time when those sheets were collected actively, right? And they were worth more than face value. But then there came a time when those sheets weren't collected actively. And, you know, this goes right back to this whole problem that we face constantly in the antiques and collectibles trade, which is if something is collected now, there's no guarantee it's going to be collected tomorrow, right? Yes. So, So what happened was is that the last time I checked on things, People were buying sheet, these sheets of stamps for about 80 cents on a dollar. So if you had a sheet with, say, 53 cents stamps on it, that was, what, a buck and a half? Right. And you could get it for a buck and a quarter or a buck 20, all right? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, here is this woman looking at these things, and these are in this estate, and the kids are saying, we don't care, just get rid of them, which is good because if they cared, they'd be, they'd be all over the world case for not selling them. But the thing about stamps, stamps is interesting. They're always worth the postage. As long as they're not used, the government has to honor them for postage, right? That's right. And one of the reasons a lot of people were buying old stamps at 80 cents of, of face value was they'd lick them and put them on envelopes. You ever get these envelopes with half a dozen different stamps? On them, right. But guess what? Not only are sheets no longer collected, but people got tired of licking the stamps. <laughs> well, and, and 1940s stamps are only worth two and three, four cents. So no, no, but she had sheets up to the 25 cent range. So, you know, you could get two of those sheets and lick two of those and you get 50 cents, which is a penny That's more right. than regular stamps. And if you could buy them for, say, 80% of face, you can put two 50 cents, two 25 cent stamps off and still send it cheaper than paying 49 cents for a new forever stamp. Yeah, but right? then you get a, a, a gummy tongue. Well, that's right. And who knows how well the glue is held up over all these years. But so I, I had a I made a, a bunch of calls to a bunch of stamp collectors. And and here's what I found. I mean, there's still people that collect the sheets, but largely for the subject matter. You know, the baseball, the sports sheets, the right. uh -huh. the military sheets, these these sheets. And and, and and you know, if you're from the state of Iowa, there's an Iowa sheet, you know, who knows what you but the stamp dealers are paying forty cents on the dollar for them, and they're selling them only at 60, forty. Okay, and they're pay, selling them at fifty to sixty cents on the dollar. So what she's what she you know, but you got to love estate sale people because their sense of optimism is overwhelming. So here's what she's doing: her estate sale open tonight, and she's going to sell them for face value for day one and two. Anybody who, well, the thing about it is, let's suppose you collected Civil War, right? And here's right. a bunch of stamps from the 60s, 70s, and 80s related to... Right, the commemoratives, like the Battle of Shiloh in the wilderness. Yeah, I have, you, I, you, know, you, know, you go in there, you go in there and say, okay, you know, I'll pay, I'll pay face for sheet to frame it, right? Buy yeah. it for the decorative value, not for their stamp value. So I suspect she'll sell some. Then on day four, day three, it's 35% off, and day four, it's 50% off. Now, I try to encourage her to call a stamp dealer in and, and simply try to sell them the whole pile, you know, at one swoop. Because, you know, if he comes in there, he's going to find it picked over. 
and that is not going to encourage him to pay a lot, right? Yeah. But it's just one of those things where, you know, all of us who were kids who collected plate blocks and, and, and sheets of stamps and saved that type of stuff, even, even the, they're not even worth the postage that, that's on them. And that just is one more example, I hate to say this, one more example of how things are valued out there, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, if there's no collector's man, there's no value. I mean, it's as simple as that. Now, a couple other fun things that happened was that she had an old Maganini violin. You know, those are those student violins from the turn of the century. Yes. But this one was in really great shape. The bow was in great shape. She was asking 85 bucks for it. I said, hell, heck. I said, you know what I said, but we'll say heck on the air here. Uh, <laughs> I said, heck, put 195 bucks on it because those things are selling for four to 800 if they're playable. And that one, all you have to do is restring it. It'll be fine. And, and you know, there was an old roller organ. You know what roller organs were? Those were those, like, Constantino organs that had right, with rolls with pegs on them. Yes. The short one didn't work. But they, they'll sell for five to 600 workable. And so, but she had 20 rolls. So I told her to pull the rolls out and sell the rolls separately in a box. Because at five bucks a roll, she had a hundred bucks. And the rolls sell for 50 to 20 bucks normally in mm -hmm. the marketplace. But now you come, now you come around to an interesting question in the trade, right? What percentage of book should you expect to pay in various sale elements in the trade? Have you ever thought about that? Not, not as a rule. In no, individual not as items. a rule. But, yeah, are, but you know Harry Rinker. There are yeah, Rinker. You've got rules. your rules. I know that. The rules that apply to all this stuff. And what happens is if you go to an auction and you are up against a dealer, right, you should be able to get it for between 50 and 65% of book because the dealer has to leave a profit margin in there. And the minute you're above his profit margin, he's dead in the water. Right? Right. Especially on low price stuff. Now, high price stuff is a little bit different thing. On the other hand, if you're up against another private collector, right? Yes. Chances are that you're going to pay close to six to seventy or eighty percent of book, if not book. Okay. And if it's a fight between two people who don't know how to sit in their hands, you can pay over value it, right? Yeah, I've seen that happen. Okay. Often. If you go to an antique show, okay, you would expect a show dealer to be looking for about a hundred percent of retail at least marking it there, maybe discounting at 10 to 20%, but still that's 100% retail market. In antique malls, you should have been looking at eight, 65 to 80 cents of the dollar, but then antique mall dealers got greedy and, and started wanting list price too, without having to go through all the trouble of setting up and all the rest of that, and a lot of stuff didn't sell through. Then when eBay is now a buy it now site, most of those people are selling for book too, right? But then you they go to buy. A yeah. state sale. What should you expect to pay at a state sale? About 50% of book. And the reason is that the state sale is going to attract private people. Collect, people are going to buy it for the reason. Private people and dealers. Well, the dealers have to have enough margin to be enticed to buy it, right? Yes. But so do the private people. But then you come down to garage sales. And I try to tell garage, sale, garage sales, they're like recycling centers. And so there, you shouldn't expect to pay more than 10 to 15 cents on the dollar. Seriously. That sounds about what I was pricing things at my last garage sale. Well, the, you, know, you know, the problem with garage sales, people have garage sales, right? And then they move 90% of the stuff back in the garage because they price it too high. Right. Tell people that having garage sales, the purpose is to get rid of the stuff, not to keep it. Yes. Well, okay, so... A moving sale, then, you've got a more motivated uh, seller. Well, you should have a more motivated seller in a garage sale, too. You know, a garage sale, you know, if you get lucky, somebody comes around the end of the day and says, I'll give you 10 bucks for everything that's left and hauls it away for you. Right. That's what happens in estate sales, by the way, and actually in some auction sales, too. In the estate sales, you know, after the fourth day, they, they have guys that come in and buy the balances cleanup merchandise. Really. But it's, but it, it's fascinating it's fascinating to see it. Well, there's some other things that we saw over at the estate sale too. We could talk about, but we did get a we did get a a uh, question from one of our our viewers that came into Worth Point this week. 
You didn't have to scrounge through my files, right? That's right. We do. We are getting. That. We are getting more people yeah. to send in their things. Yeah, and our reputation is at risk. Uh oh. Yes, because this woman wrote to us before, right? Oh, right. Yes. This woman wrote to us before, and 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 told us that that we had helped her. And now, not you know you know the, you know I try to tell people. There's this magnificent phrase called quit while you're ahead. <laughs> right? Right. And this woman apparently has never heard of this phrase because she, we treated her so well the first time that she thought, well, I'm going to send them another photograph of another object, right? Well, I hope she had this object in hand and didn't go out hunting for something and buying it on speculation. Oh, heavens, let's hope not. <laughs> anyway, here's the email we got. It says was addressed to you. I don't know why you get all the credit for this stuff, Greg. It says, uh, year, you and Harry were helpful to be in valuing two Joan Moreau prints. Yeah, Miro. I'm hoping you can help me again. Well, the news is we can always help people, whether we're helping them in a positive or a negative way is another matter. Okay, I sent you some pictures of two watercolors I recently found, and I've not been able to find out anything about either the artist Guy Waters, or the gallery that sold the pieces, okay? Can you help me again? Now, wait a minute. Oh, are you going to pull one of them up a while? Well, do you, you want to well, well, talk? Up there. Leave it up there. There's more to the email. All right. He said, I know the type frames are called force perspective, really. I have another name for them, but we'll go into that later. And that these types of frames were used extensively by a mid-century artist named Carlo. Whoever the heck Carlo was, spelled with a C, by the way. The artist worked in California as quite a following for his work. I'm hoping that perhaps these watercolors might be of some value to these collectors or just to anyone who enjoys mid-century works. I'd appreciate any help you could give me in coming up with a fair price for these watercolors, right? Right. Okay, first first comment. And, and, and listen, people have to know, that there are some rules to asking me a question. Rule number one is if you ask me a question, I assume you want to answer it. B, number two, rule number two is that there isn't anything I don't have an opinion about, and C, if you'd rather not know my opinion, you're smarter not sending me your email, right? All true. All true. I mean, because I am a no holds, bars, no punches, pull. No, look. All true. Whatever, whatever she paid for this is more than they're worth. Okay, so let's deal with basics. All right. Well, first of all, I it, it, that just looks like a an inexpensive wooden frame to me. It may have some distress value on the wood where they created that driftwood effect, but I don't think the frame has value independently. And if it does, it's probably not more than ten or fifteen bucks, right? Okay. Now, now you you said in some of my courses, did you do the painting one that I did? No, no, I did but, not sit through that one. that one. One of the things we we painting a. Uh, we, we worked hard in the painting authenticating class and so forth is, is to use a basic principle. And that was, does it look valuable? Okay. Does this look like a highly trained academic artist? No, 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 you don't. I don't think so. And the other side of it too, is that, that, that is a long way from abstract. That looks like that guy that used to do those paintings on public television in five minutes. Bob Ross. Okay. Yes, I don't see any artistic quality in the two paintings. Yeah, well, here's the name of the game, right? She asked for my opinion. But okay. But I realize that there are painters who paint paintings that I don't think a lot of and still have value, all right? So the only way we can tell if an artist has value is if there's an established secondary market for the artist, right? Yes. So. I went into my art databases. I have access to askart.com. Here's the guy, Guy Waters, right? Walters. Yeah. Walters. Walters. Guy Walters, right? And guess what? There was nothing in the database. Okay? There's no established secondary market for this guy's work. And the minute you find that, man, it's all about the potential decorative value of the pieces, and that's all it's about. All right? Yeah. On the other hand, having said that, Right. Yeah. 
I did the same thing for Guy Walters and got a lot of hits on Guy and also Walters, but nothing, none of this man's art. But nothing about Guy Walters and his art. However, nothing about him specifically. Nothing, not in the Worthopedia. Okay, and so you know now we don't find him in, in the the major da databases, right? Correct. And and we don't find him in your database. I mean, the major art nope. databases. Yours is a major database. I do not wish to suggest for one moment that yours is not a major database. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. But, but anyway, but lo and behold, thanks to your diligent efforts, and so maybe she should really really credit you, right? Yeah, I, I found one. Yes, you did. <laughs> Much to my surprise, I will tell you. And, and without sounding rude, if you compare the signature, right? Yeah, there's there's one signature. And, and, and it looks like the signature on there, right? So heaven forbid it's the same guy, right? Looks pretty close. Right. So what did you find? Well, this uh, this particular watercolor is for sale, yes. and uh, how much are they the gallery, asking? They're asking uh, five hundred ninety-five dollars in the a fairly large painting, twenty-eight by uh, thirty-six. Where is the sale at, by the way. Uh, it's a place called Urban Americana. It's in design, so my guess yeah. is that's a design price right there. Well, not only is it a design price, it's an idiotic price. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, seriously, come on. Uh, I, I mean, ser seriously, uh, in, in, in all fairness to everybody that we're talking about here, right? Who, who, who in their right mind would pay $600 for that painting? For an artist with no track record whatsoever? Sorry, well, if you like sailboats in a canal. Right. And, and, and if that's for sale on the West Coast or somewhere, then by heavens to Betsy, it's there. But now there's a good news. The good news, I, and I hate to say this, the good news, okay? And I'm just double-checking the ASCAR database for Guy Walters to make sure that I was right in saying that he doesn't exist there, and I am correct in saying that he doesn't exist there. Okay. Now... There are, you know, decorators don't give a who about long-term value, right? All they yeah. care about is what can I get for it. And look where it came from. Modern Art Gallery in Los Angeles, California. And, yeah. and, you, see, and you see the 16 on there? Yeah, that's a zone number, isn't it? Well, yes, but what does it tell you? What does uh, it I, don't, I don't know Los Angeles' do? zones. How does it help you date the painting? Come on here. Well, yeah, it's uh, pre-zip code, and uh, that's right. The zip code came in when sixty. Ugh. Oh, come on now! You, I've been hammering this into your head. This, this is you know, this is one of those dates that everybody yeah. in the trade should know. I mean, seriously, it is a date that everybody in the trade should know. The zip code, the five-digit zip code. It's different from area codes, which didn't all arrive at the same time. So you can't use area codes and telephone numbers easily to identify and date them unless you do extensive research on the telephone, on the zip, on the area code number. But in terms of the post office, the five-digit zip code arrived on July 1st, 1963. Three, okay. So you know that, that this painting was sold by this modern art gallery all right, in the mid fifties or six, in the fifties or sixties, early sixties, yeah. right? So I mean, it, we know where it comes from, and and so here's the name of the game: you send it back out to California, somebody might get excited about it, or or because it's a southwestern sheet, you got to sell it. But you're right, you got to sell it for its decorative value. But decorative value is not six hundred bucks. No. Now here's the name. Here's the name of the game. If I was advising this person about these things, right, which we are to some extent, right? Yes. I would say to this person as follows. Sell them as a pair. Don't don't try to split them. And any and here's my here's my philosophy. 
50 to 75 bucks will sell them quickly. 100 bucks might sell them. Anything over 100 and a half is going to be a struggle. And I mean, it would be nice if they were better, but I mean, there's no track record on this guy. And forget the $600. Nobody's going to buy that painting for 600 bucks. Nobody's going to buy, you know, here's, here's, a, good, here's a good question for you, okay? Mm-hmm. You remember the remember the seascape we saw? Now notice notice I just raised its value by the way I referred to it. As seascape, yeah. Yes, instead of a bunch of stupid boats in the water. Uh, but okay, but the assigned watercolor. Well, what does that mean? In an oak and linen frame. Oh, geez. But what well, all right, it, let's let's play the what would sell it quickly number game. Because that's a game that everybody should play when they're looking at something, especially pe dealers who are. What can you sell it for in a week or a month at best? What do you think? Are, are we talking about this painting or the or the yeah the yeah. southwest? Yeah, this one. No, this one. The the the, the, the seascape. All right. So um, sixty-five, eighty-five bucks. Well, are we using uh, adjectives? A hundred would push it up for this. Or adverbs. <laughs> what? Are we using adverbs or adjectives? No, I, I think that I think if the, the the realistic value of this paying sixty five to eighty five bucks. Okay. I mean it's I mean it's good size. What is it? Twenty five by thirty six. Twenty eight by thirty six. And yeah, that's I mean, probably the frame size. Okay, but that's but that's it's good size. But my lord, it's a terrible artist. It's not modern enough to be modern. It's not abstract enough to be abstract. It's not really realistic enough to be realistic. It is the nebulous school of painting. <laughs> you know, you're talking about your rules. You're I remember going to get sued by the guy that's trying to sell this. By the way, at this point, but what possibly, the... yeah. You know, so I... I remember you wrote a column years ago about the uh, the different. Um, scales of painters uh, or artists skills yes and uh, this is a guy that should have got this, this looks art. like um, took some art classes guy yeah took some art classes didn't do well I would say it never got the hang of it <laughs> Maybe we should have that as a classic category for artwork. The never got a hang of it artist. Yeah. Well, I think I think I would, that would fall. That would be a big pile. Actually. That would be a huge pile. <laughs> well, anyway. Well, I don't know. We, it, it, you know, I like to think we've helped the woman because we've done what she's asked us. Come up with some ideas for prices, right? Right. But the simple truth of the matter is, unfortunately for her, blah blah blah, blah and the rest of it. Unfortunately for her. Uh, there's not a lot of value. We're not looking at a lot of value here. All right? Yeah. But if you're willing to have your work subjected to this type of high, really severe criticism, no, or would like us to know what we, what we think, send your question to community at worthpoint.com. There we are. Community at worthpoint.com. Uh, we appreciate the information the woman gave us about the paintings. And, and so forth. Uh, we like we like the fact she gave us a number of pictures, including the information on the back, and all the rest of that type of stuff. Also, if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, well, we're good. We're good to go there too. And that is that we would be more than delighted to talk about any topic. Uh, as I told you, there's nothing in this trade I don't have an opinion about. And so, uh, if you have a thought on something, or maybe you don't like what we had to say about something, you want to take issue with us. Hey, we'll read that on on the. Uh, uh, during the course of the program, too. Community at worthpoint.com. All right? Yep. Well, I want to I want to end um, the uh, session by talking about World War I, strangely enough. Remember, okay. we, remember we talked earlier today about stamp collecting, and if there's no buyers, it's there. Well, we're, we're in the 100th anniversary of World War I right now, right? America's yes. entry into World War I. And it'll be over on the 11th day of the 11th month on the 11th hour in France in 2018. That's when the war ended, right? Yes. And who cares? I mean, it's really interesting. 
America has done little to celebrate the World War One. In fact, I was reading an editorial in in in, in uh, one of the trade papers. The uh, here I'll get it up here. Get a plug for the trade paper here. The uh, Great Great Lakes Trader. Okay, and the the woman wrote an editorial. First of all, she started the editorial by talking about how little interest has there has been in the 50th anniversary of the Vietnamese War. And as you know, the the major group of veterans today are Vietnamese veterans, not World War II veterans anymore. And then she went on from there to say, look, you know, it's the 100th anniversary of World War One, a war that the war to end all wars, you know, a very patriotic thing. Now, you would think that 100th anniversaries would still draw a crowd, so to speak. Now, we know 150th anniversaries don't draw a crowd, and we know 200th anniversaries aren't so high. We'll see how the 250th anniversary of America revolutionary events that are coming up in a couple of years does. But the truth of the matter is that 100 should, should be there. And we're, we're not doing much of anything. Now, there's some museum exhibits at military museums and so forth. And I, when I was in Washington last week, I th think I mentioned I was up in the Library of Congress and there was an interesting World War I exhibit in one of the wings of the Library of Congress building. Mm -hmm. And I, I pulled together some of the some of the posters and maps and other things from the library's collection. And it was fun to see it. And people were poking around in there. But Nobody was spending any time looking at the exhibits. Nobody was spending any time really deeply involved in looking at the exhibits. And when you go up to militaria, world, it's you know you want you want I want to write a book called the Forgot Stuff from Forgotten Wars. I mean, back in the 1980s when I first started tracking the market stuff, Spanish American War stuff was hot. Nobody cares anymore about Spanish. You can't even give Spanish American war stuff away. And the same is true for World War I stuff. Now, maybe some of the helmets and, and the rifles and so forth, but, but it just is like somehow, somehow along the way, interest in World War I has just disappeared. I mean, it's not that there aren't some devotees and the reenactment groups and whatever, but the nation as a whole has no identity, no identity with with World War One. Now it'll be interesting to see what happens when the 100th anniversary of World War II comes around. When the 50th anniversary came around, there were so many people still living that, you know, the post office did all these magnificent sheets of stamps centering around the war, you know, a different set of, a different paint of stamps for each year of the war and all that type of stuff. I don't think, I don't see it happening. No. Well, in fact, I got to tell you, nobody, nobody alive today that's got any, any connection to the war anymore. That's right. That's that's right. And and they're not spending any time teaching it in school other than here here was a series of years in which the world was at war uh, and here's an important date or two but there's no um, there's not there's no in-depth study of of the war. So that makes sense that not many people are interested in it. Yeah, among the stuff that that the scale had at the state sale was a bunch of World War One Liberty Bond loan pins. You know that they, they sold Liberty Bonds during World War One as well as World War Two, right? And yeah. you know you see newsreels of the Hollywood stars selling Liberty Bonds for World War One and whatever. Charlie Chaplin was one of the big sellers. I'm trying to remember Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks. I mean they were big in that type of stuff. So you see a pin from that era, right? We're talking about a pin that is a hundred years old. You get fifty cents or a buck for it. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, if you remember a few months ago, exactly. we had those, we had those baseballs that were donated from the, from the Y to the soldiers. That was in world war two. No, I thought it was, it was in world war one. Right. Right. But, but they, they had value only because they had the YMCA and the bat and they were signatures of famous ball players and some signatures are worth more than others. That's right. There was the, the fact that it was world nobody war one was ancillary. Nobody bought them because they were played without a world war one military base. Exactly. They were, they were so their sole value remaining value was, was, was their was sports value. The That's right. To the, to the signature of the, of the player. So fortunately that, that they had some value, but all the world war one literature. Now world war one posters are a whole nother matter because they're, they're sold as that art exam. is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, the art the art's spectacular, as a matter of fact. 
All right. Well, here again, as the Car Talk people would say, people wasted another perfectly good half hour with us today. Uh, and we have some fun stuff coming up. But again, let's get that uh, that that logo up there, community at worthpoint.com. We really, you know, as much as I love doing this, and, and, and certainly I'm not going to run out of stuff to talk about, we would love to respond to what you would like us to talk about. So if you've got any ideas, thoughts, want to share your comments with us, uh, send us images uh, for us to talk about on there. Send it to community at worthpoint.com. Meanwhile, we'll be doing this next week at the same time, as they say. And uh, say, uh, say good night to everybody. All right. Well, good night, Harry. And uh, good night, everybody else. We'll see you next week. Let me get this slide up. A little bit delayed here. <laughs> All right, Harry, you have a good one. Hey, you too, buddy. All right. Bye-bye.